So today I am joined by the one and only Brimmer. You good, mate? Good I know man. it's an awkward cool. setting. Um, when we got told about today, it was basically it has to be in the boot room. So we've got a few people watching. We've got these parade lads over here watching as well. Yes. Um, to tell me about yourself, you know, what was the first football memory, uh, apart from playing the game, do you remember anything about actually watching a first game on TV? Um, I just remember my old man was a massive Liverpool supporter, so... This I mean, is the part I leave now, I think. Liverpool, mate. Yeah, Liverpool supporter. Well, they were with Adidas. Yeah? A few years ago, Yeah, maybe. And what was the memory, ago? though? Like, was it more dad being passionate about yeah. the game? I think that was the biggest thing. Dad was a massive um, Liverpool fan, so... You know, and a football fan, so I just grew up with football. I had no choice, really. It was football, football, football. And you love those sort of mornings to, to get together, but also those early mornings. Is that would you say early mornings represent football to you as well now? Yes, most definitely. Do I more miss? so as professional, but also as a football fan in Australia? Yeah, big time. Yep. That's the hardest. Like I enjoy waking up early now with my daughter and watching the games, even though she doesn't understand what's going on. She's only two, yep. which you understand when they're little. Yeah, definitely. Um, is that something like a DNA personality that's a trait, you reckon, for an Australian footballer? Yeah. The dedication of waking up so early? 100%. Like, you know, the Premier League games are on at 3 o'clock in the morning, so when my daughter wakes up at 3 o'clock, I'm just, you know, flip the phone on and just deal with her while watching the game. It's the best feeling also because it's like you can have breakfast and watch the game. Um, but for you, I think now being in that state as a professional footballer and seeing how the game's progressing in Australia, do you still think it's great to be able to enjoy the game around the world, although you're playing in Australia, like you see a lot of young kids and everyone supporting the big stars over, overseas, but would, do you feel confident that you, you're doing enough for local kids to uh, yeah, follow Australian football? Yeah, I think it's quite difficult for us footballers in Australia because no one knows what it's like unless you've been over there to experience what um, the culture is over there and how they live and breed football. Whereas in Australia, you know, you've got... Almost part-time. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like a part-time, but until you get into like the A-League, um, you're really training maybe two, three times a week if you're... Whereas over in England, yeah, you're full-time. Like I remember going over there and signing at Liverpool when I was 16 at the time. And I, was, I went from training three times a week to training six, seven times a week. Yeah. I think that's the biggest difference. Um, from there to here, yeah. We've heard a lot of the stories, you know, I actually spoke to the team and everyone knows how much your parents had to sacrifice for your future and that's amazing to see, like, it pays off. And I, I've seen a lot of kids in the in the young times, um, you know, watching my brother's career, sort of like everyone else making it, but the sacrifice is what sometimes makes the person who they are. And not only are we able to watch you now on the, on, on the game here in Australian A-League, but that story of yours going to Liverpool, um, how was it not only leaving everything that you knew about in Australia, but like moving to a whole different, I'd say a different world because, you know, I've spoke to another A-League player recently who's confused why no one really talks about the round ball here in Australia. Was that a massive change for you? Yes. Um, first personally, of all, everything, yeah, yeah. Personally, everything. Um, it was very difficult at the start. Um, I struggled to make friends. I struggled to make friends and there was a, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough time for me and mum and dad had sacrificed pretty much everything. Um, they sold the house, my younger brother came, he obviously sacrificed a lot himself, but my older brother stayed as well. So it was a very difficult time for my family as well because they'd left their, the eldest son and yeah, well. you know, he pursued his, his dream and what he wanted to do um, growing up. But you know, mentally that just made me stronger and made me a better Selling football. the house is a massive, massive yeah. thing. Was that something, you know, moving over to the UK also, the culture of football, was that a massive awakening for you? I know you said you watched the games in the morning, so you knew the identity of where you're going. Of course, amazing for you to be able to go represent the Reds, yeah. who you watched in the mornings, but like the livelihood, the sort of different, the streets, the smell yeah. of the UK air. 100%. You're probably used to the cold weather yeah. now. 100%. That, How was it moving to London, uh, to Liverpool? Yeah, it was a bit like, you know, it was the hardest thing ever, but also at the same time, it was the best, you know, experience I ever had. And you touched on it, everything's football there. It's absolutely yeah. mental. Like, they live and breathe football. Like, everything is, you know, you wake up, you go to the pub to drink before a game in terms of if you're watching. And, <laughs> oh, no, and, not before a game, though. <laughs> not, well, <laughs> if you're a fan, yeah, to go yeah. to Liverpool <laughs> games. But, yeah, like, everything's football and, you know, like, coming from Australia to go over there and I never experienced the gym side of thing as well and um, they're massive on, on that and strengthening your body early yeah. at a young age and you know that all hit hard and 
you know, I copped a few injuries in the first year, which was difficult, but like I said, I, it was the best, best experience I've ever had. How was it understanding the Scalzer accent? I still don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> My wife watches Love Island. She always comes, she goes, why do they sound different? I'm like, hey, that's one thing you understand about the UK. Everyone's yeah. got different Look, uh, dialects and stuff. Yeah, it's like Manchester's 45 minutes away. They've got a different accent. And then there's a the London accent. Birmingham. Birmingham and Liverpool has to be the worst by far to be, for me. <laughs> yeah, it has to be the worst. I, look, I think... Um, your name came about in the early days here as Australians, you know, not only do we love the world game, but to see others in our sort of, you know, someone that we can see ourselves into, you know, move over there and, you know, play the, foot, the, play the game we all love. How was it, you know, playing the game though? Was it a whole different mindset for you to understand and also play? Yeah, there was a lot different sorts of training in terms of like the tactical side of thing. I never really understood the tactical side where the club I played for here at, and at Nunna Wadding at the time um, was all with the ball. So technically I was really good and was probably one of the better ones over there, but like the tactical side and the physical side, I was, that's where I lacked and that's where I, um, I struggled. Yeah, and of course the weather-wise, uh, going from, you know, easy conditions in some sort of Australian places, depending where you're playing, you've played on both sides of the, the massive country that we live in. Um, was the difference in sort of the facilities though? Like seeing, yeah. you know, playing at sort of small Nutterwadding sort of regions oh, yeah. or like Moorabark or, you know, Hallam or yeah. Dalverton, going over there and playing at your local, but it's like almost like semi, semi stadium, semi professional yeah. facilities. So is that another awakening yeah. for you to understand the like whole I'll, difference? I was getting breakfast and lunch every single day. Yeah. Um, I had about 10 training grounds, including like a synthetic pitch, and then obviously the main pitch was had like some heating snow thing that gets rid of the snow <laughs> when it snows so but yeah it was a different climate as well that was quite difficult to um get used to because obviously here in australia it doesn't really get past minus um in terms of the weather or oh, it depends where you are yeah yes man down in maybe a bit colder <laughs> um yeah coming back to australia you played at perth and again wearing that color and coming back to the a-league whole different world for you you know you're you were at a not only a young age but like becoming an adult. How was it then tra transitioning from a youthful player to sort of the adult level and playing yeah. professional games in the Australian sort of game? How was that transition for you, going away from what you've become and known to now to readjusting? Yeah, um, I think I was a bit not, well, I wasn't used to this sort of lifestyle and I never really got used to the lifestyle over in England. So coming back home, I thought the transition was quite easy. I Yes, I struggled a bit at the start in terms of playing games. I was on the bench a lot and that was quite difficult, but obviously the more you train and get used to the, you know, the surroundings that you're a part of, um, it became a lot easier for me and I felt, felt at home, which was, which was good. Perth's a quiet city though. No, nah, Perth's a great city. Is it? Oh, there we go. Perth so exclusive there city. for you. Yeah. I think like moving to Perth would have been a big change for you in the understanding of like just how the mindset fitting into a new, not only city, but also the A-League at a time. Did you watch much of the A-League when you were away? Yes. Um, Mum and Dad were members actually at Melbourne Victory uh, up until I think my last, would have been my last year at Liverpool. So I sort of stayed in touch in terms of watching it. And obviously when I knew I was signing at Perth, I then began to, to watch it a bit more. So, yeah. so when you left Australia, you had, you had set connection to victory yes okay that's um, good that's mom good. and dad were members from the very beginning so, so they were proud when they see yeah. you represent only the liverpool side but also victory. the victory side oh, that's amazing look yeah. you never get that opportunity i think a lot of footballers we hear the stories where they love something but never get to represent yeah, that team correct. so for you to be able to wear that on your chest was Definitely. amazing dream come true um like i said it was the best experience that i've ever had you know, yeah going to the my boyhood club and representing them was something special perf you know fitting in that squad having some amazing games how was the whole season for you? Like, you know, of course, injuries and everything aside, but, you know, just playing in Australia, you know, now we see how far you've come to the victory level. You know, we see you not only win uh, the Cup and, of course, Johnny Warren medals, but going back to Perth, do you reckon all that hard work pays off? Yes, definitely. I learned a lot in England, but then obviously what I did this year, I definitely think being in Perth and what I learned there would definitely contributed to the success I had uh, last year so yeah most definitely being sort of the athlete yourself but now adding the family value to it does it change the mindset Big you know time. just i know not many people understand it. it's like your child is everything to you 
how is it being away from them, even though the game is your livelihood now, but it's your life, how is it being away from the little ones? It's very difficult. Um, well, what's the longest know, like time? It, the longest time would have been probably three, four months, and that was when my two-year-old um, was profound deaf and she had surgery and stuff, so that was quite difficult to not be being away. Part, yeah. no. I wasn't a part of it. I missed the surgery and you know there was I remember we've had a game that night and I was panicking because you know I just wanted to be there for my daughter but that's the sacrifices you sort of have to make in football and you know I look at her now and she's like a normal child so mm. it's tough. And the the being there for your child also but also having to train and keep that sort of professional element of yourself pushing yourself to achieve a lot lot more. We've seen what you've done so far. Um, and we've seen the celebration and I actually heard about that. I think it was Jake Bakadish, the podcast. Yeah. But then recently I did a photo shoot with uh, McLaren, yeah. of course, City. And he goes to me, you know, that's special to you. Yeah. Is it something also now as a footballer and, of, of course, having that family value? Is that, again, something that you're working harder to not only represent yourself but represent the family? Yeah, definitely. I think you just touched on it perfectly is that, you know, I go out there every day to train and do it for them because there's nothing more I see and love when I see my kids, you know, happy and smiling in the stands and when I score and, you know, before every game I ask them all, like, how, how many goals do you want me to score today? And the smile on their face that, you know, when they put the kid on and they get to come and watch Daddy plays, it's just amazing. Like, yeah. It makes me better. It makes, you know, everyone else around me better as well. Of course. And touching on the whole basis, uh, the celebration, though, you know, so, of course, for anyone listening to this, that celebration with your hands in the, in the ears. Yeah, it's for my... Uh, Two-year-old, Hazel, um, she was profound deaf at birth, so um, it was very difficult for my partner, uh, Brianna and I, at the time, but luckily enough, we got um, onto a surgeon that did cochlear implants, and so now she has two cochlear implants in both ears, and she's pretty much a normal child now. Like, you wouldn't think anything different. She can hear everything, and just the speech that um, lets her down a little bit, but that's uh, to come and to work on. Being a parent, nonetheless, is always a tough one. And, you know, being an athlete together at the same time, you're away from the family, you're away from the game, you're always trying to find time to, you know, push yourself at higher levels. National team squad, there's always that, you know, don't worry, a lot of people at Ultra um, always say, it, like, you know, not only are you should be in the squad, in the green and gold, but I know deep down you're fighting for that position and to get that. Is there... Is that a, a long-term hunger for yourself to be in that green gold? Yes, most definitely. That's my dream. It's anyone's dream as a kid to, to be a part of the, the country that you were born in and to represent them and to play for them. So, to be honest, I was a bit disappointed that I wasn't picked in um, the most recent uh, call-up. I know I had a slight uh, strain in my car, but I've been back to full training now for at least a week, so it was a bit disappointing. But... Me as a footballer, I'll put my head down and keep working to, to get in that team and do more than what I've done already to be a part of it. It's a big season coming up. I know it's the longest pre-season ever in uh, any sort of football, I think. Um, I always try to research if anyone's longer than us. How is it, though, preparing for a new season? Look, I don't think anyone that is associated with any soccer in Australia that is part <laughs> of the A-League would tell you they enjoy the pre-season. Yeah. Um, here because that's that's a lie but um the reality is it's the best because you know you're going to that round one and you're fit especially under the boss we have here at victory um you know everyone's ready everyone's can't wait to the season to start now but most definitely don't enjoy pre-season nah and what what would your hot take be for yourself though to change in the Australian game like you know 10 years from now what's the one big thing you think that the football mindset or just the football in Australia should change what's the what's like a, what's your biggest hot take on that I think it's just the youth um, I don't think we train enough at the age of 15 16 it's you know it's, it's very rare that you find a team that's training six days a week it's mm. just, you know some teams are training two to three times and it's just not you know we're competing with AFL and I think that's probably the biggest the biggest problem yeah and it's something I always talk, talk to other Europeans when they come to Australia. It's like, yeah, AFL's in the newspaper. And, yeah. of course, you live in the whole UK life and then coming back, you're seeing that difference. Yeah. It is what it is, and it's the hardest thing. Um, but yourself being represented by the Three Stripes, and we've got a beautiful man over there, Leia, yes. watching over. Um, what's one of your favourite boots? I know early days, you know, you'd be wearing... I think it was the F50s, 20, 2014. The, the yellow one? Yeah. I wore them until the studs were like that. So they were my most favourite boot. 
I'd Are you say that's probably yeah the best one I've ever. Watched. And ritual wise, before a game, left foot, right foot, anything specific in terms of any rituals that you do? Not really, no. I just walk out on the pitch. In terms of like what if I'm walking out on the pitch? Uh, even in the change rooms, is there an, is there a particular way that you would put on your boots or? Um, if you yeah, don't follow actually, the yeah, mindset, left, I'd put my left foot, my left boot on first. Then you don't right, think about it; then, it just happens. Yeah, and then I tie my left lace and then my right lace. Uh, I don't ever forget one of the wor like my, my early days at MPL, like probably before MPL. I was like to myself, I'm going to put my left boot on today <laughs> and my right foot, and I that was the biggest Stuck regretful thing. Yeah. <laughs> Look, we hear, hear it all. I've done, I've done it once or twice where I put my right on and I've actually taken it off because <laughs> I didn't put my left on. No one thinks about it. I think it's even like those things I used to watch. I used to idolise Beckham as a young kid and he used to hold his sleeves before a free kick. <laughs> and it's one thing I always made sure if we got kits at the start of the season, I made sure I got a long sleeve. But if I didn't, I always got like, I think skins came out yeah, earlier. Right. So, so I made sure it was always longer. So I had to hold it like this. <laughs> even now when I wear jumpers, I have to hold the sleeves. It just reminds me of that. Uh, I think it was one of the early World Cups or Euros where he was holding the sleeves and I was like, that, that's there it. There you go. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, one last thing before we let you go. Like, Ultra is a huge fan of yours, but also um, for dedicated footballers. One thing I always love, and that's something I was saying before, is I love when footballers actually have a personality to inspire the next generation. There's always that you know, tough sort of um, breaking the mould of what the parents were and being who you are, yeah. being yourself. I love when, you know, sleeves and tats. Um, is that something that you also feel is a story to a part of you? Um, I wouldn't say it's a story to me, but I definitely do love my sleeves and my tattoos because you know i've got i've got one in every country that Don't i've right, been I've, to and i've started but yeah <laughs> can't can't stop yeah look i'll probably get my whole you know, i've got my chest done already but i think everywhere else is to come still so. uh good advice I've, I've actually given my daughter who can't draw yet but i said to her make sure when you draw your first stick figure of me that's Perfect. gonna be tattered on my quad. Oh, beautiful. It's it's probably the best thing I've like. That's that's your drawing forever. I, I don't know. It's putting on the fridge just like for <laughs> once, but that's forever. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, look, like I said, we're um, always behind you here at Ultra, and we always thank you for coming down. But um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate your time. Thanks, man. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it.